Come join me on my second channel, Jaguar Gator 8, where we'll talk all things college football. New video drops every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch the latest video. And now, on with our feature presentation. Remember during the 2020 NFL Draft when the Green Bay Packers drafted Jordan Love and all the uproar about that pick? Aside from the fact that the Packers were in win-now mode and drafting a quarterback with Aaron Rodgers on the roster wasn't going to help you win now, aside from the fact that Love had very questionable tape from college and was a bit of a project, and aside from the fact that the Packers did nothing to address an already shaky wide receiver unit, the main uproar from this pick centered around the Packers not even informing Rodgers that they were drafting his successor. You can argue whether they owed him that right or not, and whether or not they should have informed him that they felt it was in their best interest to draft a future quarterback to eventually replace you. However, many people thought that this was a classless move on the part of the Packers front office, and that a little heads up would have been nice, because they completely butchered that situation. Let me tell you, what happened in 2020, in terms of class, is child's play compared to what you're about to see. Because imagine a team legend who would have been an instrumental part of the team's success over the years, finding out during the draft, with no heads up whatsoever, that he wasn't coming back. No phone call from the general manager, no warning. He found out during a press conference that the team held, finding out indirectly that he wasn't going to be coming back after nearly a decade with the team. It was a move that left a sour taste in the mouths of a lot of people, and more than a quarter century later, still does to some. At the 1997 NFL Draft, the Packers treated outgoing kicker Chris Jackie with no class whatsoever. And this is the story behind the most classless draft pick in the over century-long history of the Packers franchise. Before I talk about the pick in question and everything that transpired that made it a horrible pick, we need some context to understand the player that the Packers had on their roster at the kicker position, and just how important he was to the team. The 1988 Packers were an abomination at the kicker position, as they had what had to be one of the worst field goal units of the post-merger era. Between Max and Dejas, Dale Dawson, and Dean Dorsey, they hit just 52% of their field goals, finishing the season with the worst field goal percentage of any team in the league, and finishing nearly 20 percentage points below the league average. As a side note, if you want to learn more about how bad their kickers were, and in particular, a horrible game they had against Washington, where Max and Dejas had what might just be the worst field goal attempt in the history of the franchise, click the card on the upper right corner. And I bring all that up because all those kicking problems were quickly forgotten when this man right here came into the fold. In 1989, the Packers spent their sixth round pick on Chris Jackie, a kicker from the University of Texas, El Paso. And just like that, all kicking woes that the Packers had magically disappeared, because Jackie came in right away and became the kicker that Green Bay was desperately looking for. In 1989, he finished eighth in the entire NFL in field goal percentage as a rookie, hitting over 78.5% of his kicks. He followed that up in 1990 by once again finishing inside the top 10 with a percentage of 76.7%, and in 1993, finished 6th by hitting 83.8% of his kicks. Over the first five seasons of his career, he never had a season below 75%, consistently ranking as one of the top kickers in the league, and hitting 78.4% of his kicks over that stretch. He always ranked in the top half of the league when it came to accuracy, and perhaps most impressive about Jackie was how good he was from distance as from 50 plus yards over those five years, he was hitting on two out of every three kicks. As Meatloaf said, two out of three ain't bad, and it especially isn't bad when we're talking about the early 1990s and field goal percentage from 50 plus yards. This was highlighted in 1993, when he went six for seven on kicks from 50 plus yards, leading the league in both total kicks made from that distance, as well as accuracy amongst all kickers with at least three attempts from that range. For his efforts, Jackie was named a first team All-Pro that season, becoming the first Packers kicker since Chester Markle all the way back in 1974 to receive AP First Team All-Pro honors. Jackie was everything that the Packers could have hoped he'd be, and then some. And in 1996, Chris Jackie was showing no signs of slowing down. This wasn't like a Mark Mosley situation from a decade before, where even though Mosley was great for the team for a long period of time, he was starting to stink by the mid-1980s, and the team needed to let him go. You can learn more about that bizarre draft story and how that incident eventually played out, by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Jackie was still a pretty solid kicker, hitting on 77.8% of his kicks, which was right around the league average of 80%. In fact, his percentage in 1996 was his highest since the 1993 campaign, when he was named a first-team All-Pro. And he had some monumental games in there, including a three-field goal performance against the Carolina Panthers in the NFC Championship that sent Green Bay to their first Super Bowl since the 1967 season, when they made it to Super Bowl II. 
and a great game against the San Francisco 49ers where he went 5-for-5, five five, with one of those kicks being the game-winning 53-yard field goal in overtime to officially win it. Jackie was one of the reasons why the Packers eventually emerged as Super Bowl champions, because he was an incredibly reliable kicker who, in his eighth season with the team, was still playing at a very high level. However, free agency is a completely different beast, and by this point, Jackie wanted to test the market just to see what he was worth. He was more than open to return with the Packers. In fact, he wanted to return to the Packers. But after getting that coveted ring, he understandably wanted to see how much he could get on the open market. As general manager Ron Wolf said, the business dictates that these guys want to go out and see what they're worth. And there's nothing you can do about that. But even though Jackie was testing the market, he wasn't finding any enticing deal just yet. To the point where a reunion with the Packers, as I said before, was on the table. Wolf wanted to bring him back and said, we would like to re-sign him. No question about it. But it's one of those things. It's got to be pretty much what we want. You know what I'm saying? In other words, if the money was right, then the Packers would bring him back. And it made sense why. Again, he was a really good kicker. He was reliable. He knew how to kick in the cold conditions at Lambeau Field. He had been with the team for eight years and had played at a high level all eight years. And by this point, was the team's all-time leader in field goals made with 173, was the team's all-time leader in extra points made with 301, and was second in team history in points scored with 820, only five points behind the legendary Don Hudson at 825. But feeling like the team was at somewhat of an impasse in the negotiations, even though Jackie indicated that he was willing to take a pay cut from his $628,000 salary from 1996, they began to look elsewhere, and look to the draft to fix their problem. And with their third round pick, when they got on the clock at pick number 90, they saw an opportunity to draft their new kicker of the future. From 1994 to 96, Penn State was one of the best teams in all of college football. They went 12-0 in 1994, winning the Rose Bowl and finishing the season ranked number two in the AP poll, although sub-publications declared them the national champions. They followed that up with a 9-3 record in 1995 and an Outback Bowl win, and followed that up in 1996 with an 11-2 record and a Fiesta Bowl win. When you have a three-year stretch where you go 32-5 and, and win over 86% of your games, especially in a conference like the Big Ten, you're doing something right, as you can make the argument that this was perhaps the most dominant three-year stretch of Penn State football ever. And while there were many reasons for that, you can't underestimate and undervalue the importance of a great kicking game. Having a reliable kicker that you don't have to worry about, that can make clutch kicks, and can constantly be dependent on for three points when called upon is huge. And from 1994 to 96, Brett Conway was that guy, as he established himself as one of the best kickers in the country. Conway was relatively new to the sport, he used to be a soccer player, and only started kicking footballs when he was 15 years old as a sophomore at Parkview High School. But he was an absolute natural at playing kicker. In 1994, he led the Big Ten in field goal percentage by hitting over 83% of his kicks, becoming the first Penn State kicker to ever lead the conference in this category, although Penn State had been in the conference for an admittedly short period of time. Over his four-year career, he hit 73.8% of his field goals, which was pretty good for a college kicker back then and he even led the Big Ten in field goals made during the 1996 season, when he split 18 of them through the uprights. On multiple occasions, he finished inside the top 10 of the entire NCAA in field goals made, finishing 5th in 1995 and 8th in 1996. And he ended his career with the Nittany Lions on a high note, as in 1996, he hit 75% of his field goals and set a career high with 93 points scored. By the time his career ended, Conway was second all-time in school history with 276 points scored only behind Craig Fayak, who was six points ahead of 282. Today, Conway's accolades are still remembered fondly, as he's fourth in the school history book in scoring, only behind Fayak, Kevin Kelly, and Saquon Barkley. His 52 field goals ranked second in school history, only behind Fayak, and his career percentage of 73.8% was the top percentage in Penn State history at the time, and still ranks since at the top five today. Aside from how accurate he was, what drew a lot of people to Conway was the fact that he was extremely clutch. There were multiple games where he hit the game-winning field goal from a fairly significant distance with no time left. He did this in the 1995 season opener against Texas Tech, and did this in the 1996 regular season finale against Michigan State, just to name a few. The all-Big Ten selection kicker was projected to get drafted as the first kicker off of the board. And while projections were all over the place, going from as high as the second round to as low as the seventh round, it was clear that Conway was going to be playing professionally at the next level and was definitely going to hear his name get called during the broadcast. Eventually, the Green Bay Packers surprised a lot of people when they were on the clock 
and took the Penn State kicker in the third round, taking him with pick number 90. Just like that, the Chris Jackie reign was over. It was a giant gamble to replace a reliable kicker who was still very good, even if he wasn't taking care of kickoff duty anymore because he lost some power in his leg. And it was a giant gamble to do this with a rookie kicker and spend high draft capital on it. The pick was heavily scrutinized, as there were definitely those that did not agree with the decision, and that's putting it mildly. He knew the situation that he was going into very well, saying on going to Green Bay, a kicker in the third round? I'm sure some of the fans are questioning it. It's tough. Cold winners, defending Super Bowl champions. There's some pressure. Probably the best fans in pro football. There's some pressure. And then the whole situation with Jackie. It's a lot of pressure. And one Wisconsin writer said on the controversial decision, considering the overall success Green Bay general manager Ron Wolf has enjoyed in the NFL draft, one would have to possess a Mel Kuyper-like ego to suggest any of the Packers' picks this past weekend were ill-advised. That said, it's difficult to not feel uneasy about Wolf's decision to select Penn State place kicker Brett Conway in the third round. However, even if you don't agree with the pick, and don't agree with the idea of taking a kicker in the third round of the draft for whatever reason, that by itself doesn't make the pick classless. That doesn't make it live up to the title of this video. This is a business, and we've seen plenty of teams get rid of good players to go younger and to go cheaper. Heck, in 1978, Miami Dolphins kicker Gary Apremian was named a Pro Bowler and led the league in field goal percentage, and he lost his job before the start of the 1979 season in a decision that Don Shula got absolutely crucified for, but turned out to some extent to be the right call. So by itself, Drafting Brett Conway to replace Chris Jackie is not classless. But it's the way that it all transpired that makes you feel a bit uneasy. Because even though Jackie and the Packers were in negotiations and were talking about possibly coming back, do you want to know how Jackie found out about this? He found out that the Packers drafted his successor secondhand. In a normal world operated by people with morals and values, how something like this would have gone down would have been like this. The Packers would have called up Jackie, thanked him for his time in Green Bay, but said that they were going in a different direction, and that wherever you wind up, you hope it works out for the best. Seems perfectly reasonable, right? Well, when the Packers drafted Conway, Jackie didn't even receive a phone call or a message or anything like that. They didn't have the audacity to tell Jackie that they were going in a different direction. Jackie had to find out from other people that after eight years, after helping them win a Super Bowl, and after being five points away from the franchise record, that they were moving on. Wolf held a press conference saying that it was time to move on, and that was it. No phone call, no invitation to come to the facility, nothing. Jackie was left out on the cold that the negotiations were over, and that after spending nearly a decade with the team, that he wasn't coming back. And let's just say that Jackie was understandably furious about this, and how the Packers handled the entire situation. He said, The Packers lied to me. They told me and they told the media that they weren't going to draft a kicker. They could have told me to my face. But this? As the best kicker the Packers have ever had, I've never tooted my own horn. But since I'm not a Packer anymore, what the heck? I was. Somebody will have to come in and kick a long time to prove otherwise. Again, all Ron Wolf had to do here was just pull Jackie up and tell him that they drafted his successor and that his time in Green Bay was done. But to not even have the audacity to do that is cowardly. And the crazy part is that during the draft, Jackie and Wolf were close to a deal with the two sides only being $25,000 apart. Green Bay was offering a $25,000 signing bonus, and Jackie won a $50,000. That was the holdup. Jackie's agent, Steve Weinberg, said on the negotiations, they signed nine other guys in the offseason. All of them got a signing bonus. Reserve defensive lineman Bob Kuberski got a $25,000 signing bonus. You tell me who's more important to the success of the team. In the end, $25,000 was kind of a token amount, so they could have their cake and eat it too. So the team had no problem contacting Jackie during the draft to talk about a deal. The two sides were in negotiations during the second round. But when it came time to inform him that they were drafting his successor and ending the negotiations, they went radio silent. Especially since Jackie didn't even visit any other teams and had every intention of re-signing with the Packers, does that not feel a bit slimy to not even keep Jackie in the loop that he no longer has a job? The response after all of this was near universal. Chris Jackie deserves significantly better of a farewell. One writer said, Chris Jackie deserved better. Despite your feelings for the suddenly former Green Bay Packers field goal kicker, he deserved more than finding out secondhand that he was history. Sure, the NFL draft is a business, and stuff like this happens every day. But the guy deserved more consideration for what he'd done for the franchise. 
And another writer said, quite bluntly, their method of execution to get rid of Jackie flat out stunk. After 136 games and 830 points, Chris Jackie earned the right to have Packers general manager Ron Wolf call and tell him his services will no longer be required at 1365 Lombardi Avenue. Jackie got no such considerations. And the funny part about all this is that, to some extent, this completely blew up in Green Bay's face. Aside from the fact that this was just a bad look, Conway was a notorious draft bust, as he missed every kick that he attempted in the preseason before getting cut. There's a reason that you're still seeing Jackie highlights in Green Bay, and not seeing any Conway highlights of his time with the Packers. And that's because he literally never made a field goal with the team in any competition. As bad as Roberto Aguayo was for the Bucks when they spent a second round pick on him, at least he, you know, made a field goal. I only say that it blew up in their face to some extent because they replaced him with Ryan Longwell, who kicked nine seasons in Green Bay and was exceptional. But it still doesn't negate the fact that not only was Conway an awful pick, but the way that they drafted him was shameful. Again, this has nothing to do with Conway whatsoever. This is entirely on Ron Wolf. And Jackie played a few more seasons in the NFL, spending the 1997 season with Washington, and then spending 1998 and 1999 down in Arizona. But he'll forever be known for his successful tenure with the Packers, which was so successful that in 2013, he rightfully got inducted into the Green Bay Packers Hall of Fame. So I think it's safe to say that at least some wounds have been healed from this departure. But it still doesn't change the fact that the way Ron Wolf handled the situation was completely classless. If a guy plays at an extremely high level for you for a decade, and you draft his successor while you're still in talks to bring him back, the least you can do is actually inform him of this and not go dark. After eight seasons with the Packers, Chris Jackie deserves significantly better than to find out secondhand that his services were no longer needed and that the Packers were moving on. Because as a general rule of thumb, not just in football, but in life as well, if you're going to move on from someone, at least have the decency to tell the person impacted by this that you're moving on. Because in this instance, Ron Wolf did not have such decency. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar Gator 9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.